everyone. Here is today's specimen. And I'll show it to you first. And now we'll put up our first polling question. So what organ is this? Okay, and I'll end the polling there. So great job, everyone. Everyone pretty much got it correct. It is in fact a kidney. So now we'll just go over some of the anatomy associated with the kidneys. So the kidneys are bean-shaped retroperitoneal organs that are located on either side of your spine below your ribs. Each kidney is about the size of a large fist. So obviously this kidney is a bit larger than the size of a fist. The blood supply to the kidneys and drainage to the kidneys is through the renal artery and vein. And the fat that's surrounding the outside of the kidney that you can see here and here, that's the perinephric soft tissue. Now we'll go and talk about the internal anatomy of the kidney, and we'll bring up our next polling question. What is the correct order of urine flow through the kidney to the bladder? And then I'll end the polling there. So yes, the correct answer is D. So it goes from the renal papilla, which you can see on the image. So the renal papilla is the apex of the renal pyramid, which are these triangular shaped tissue that consists of the medulla. And then it drains into the minor calyx, then the major calyx, and then the renal pelvis, and then into the ureter. So it's important to differentiate between the renal pelvis and the renal sinus. The renal pelvis, like we mentioned, drains the urine into the ureter. And then the renal sinus is all of the fat that's surrounding the renal pelvis. So for our specimen here, we have our renal pelvis. And then all of this fat that you see around here is then the renal sinus. Talking about the parenchyma of the kidney, so going outside in, it starts with the capsule, which is the most outside aspect, and then the renal cortex, and then the renal medulla, which is the innermost layer. And we don't really see that on our kidney here because there's some sort of pathology occurring. Now we'll talk about cystic kidney diseases, because if you may have guessed, that's why our kidney is out today. We'll talk about the three most common types of cystic kidney diseases, that being autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, and acquired cystic kidney disease. So we'll start with our first one here. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And that's actually the reason why the specimen here is out. So it is a hereditary disorder that's characterized by multiple expanding cysts of both kidneys that ultimately destroys the renal parenchyma and causes renal failure. These kidneys can get very enlarged. The one in the photo there is actually over three kilograms. And the one that we have out here today is about 1.5 kilograms. Just in comparison, a normal kidney only weighs about 160 grams. And another thing to point out coloration wise, so the photo in the PowerPoint is taken in fresh state, so it has not been fixed yet. And the specimen that we have here today has been fixed in formalin, so that's why it's more of a pale tan color. This disease is due to mutations in PKD1 and PKD2 genes, and it affects roughly one of every 400 to 1,000 live births in a year. 
And these cysts are not uh, present at birth, but develop slowly over time. So the onset of renal failure usually occurs in middle age or late adult life. And these account for approximately 5% to 10% of end-stage renal disease cases that are requiring transplantation or dialysis. So we'll put up our next polling question here. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is associated with all of the following except Okay, so I'm going to end the polling there and share the results. So it looks like it's a tie between epidural hemorrhage and mitral valve prolapse. The correct answer is that it is not associated with epidural hemorrhage. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is associated with hepatic cysts, berry aneurysms, which are a cause of death in about 4% to 10% of these patients mitral valve prolapse, and as well, renal cell carcinoma. And I'll put up our next polling question here. So what subtype of RCC is most commonly associated with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? Okay, so I'm going to end the polling question there and share the results. So yes, it is clear cell RCC. And that one is also the most common subtype in the general population as well. So now we're going to be moving on and talking about autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. So this again is a hereditary disorder and it's characterized by bilateral renal cysts that typically present prior to or at birth. These cysts are a lot smaller than the ones that we saw in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And they typically form more of a radial ray appearance of the cysts that are perpendicular to the cortex. And it gives the kidney more of a sponge-like appearance, like the one shown in the PowerPoint image there. This disease happens in about one per 20,000 live births, and it's due to the mutation PKHD1 gene. Frequent complications are due to limited urine output, including oligohydramnios, potter sequence, joint deformities, and pulmonary hypoplasia. Early mortality is common and usually is due to pulmonary complications. So now acquired cystic kidney disease, and I'll put up our next polling question. So which of the following gross features are slash is associated with acquired cystic kidney disease? Okay, so I'm going to end the polling question there. So the correct answer is D. So it is A and C. So they're usually normal size or sometimes can be even smaller than a normal kidney and do contain multiple cortical and medullary cysts. So here's an image here just showing how they look differently than the autosomal dominant and the autosomal recessive kidneys. They're a bit smaller in their size. And then as well, the cysts are a bit smaller than the ones that we typically see in autosomal dominance. So you can see that these cysts are quite large here. So acquired cystic kidney disease is a condition that occurs in patients with end-stage renal disease who have undergone prolonged dialysis. And these patients do not have a history of any other cystic renal diseases. The longer the time the patient is on dialysis for, the greater risk the patient has for developing acquired cystic kidney disease. So for example, if the patient is on dialysis for three years, then they have approximately 10 to 20% risk versus if the patient is on dialysis for 10 years, then they have a 90% risk. 
Most of these cases are asymptomatic, but can sometimes cause hematuria if the cyst bleeds. These patients are also at an increased risk for renal cell carcinoma. And for these patients, the most common type of RCC is acquired cystic disease associated renal cell carcinoma. So that's different than the one that we saw with autosomal dominant, which was clear cell. So now we'll talk about opening and freshing these specimens. So we'll first wanna start by taking the weight of the specimen, because if you can imagine, as soon as we cut into it, a lot of that liquid from the cyst is going to come out and that will change the weight. Then once we've weighed our specimen, then we're going to want to make a few cuts that are perpendicular to the hilum. For these cases, we don't need to usually worry about inking the outside of the specimen or the resection margin because they're not out for malignancy. If there is any sort of suspicion for malignancy, then we're going to be wanting to ink our perinephric soft tissue resection margin, which would be the whole exterior side. Now we'll go through and talk about grossing. So first we wanna make sure that our patient identifiers are all correct. And then we'll wanna check our clinical history to make sure that the specimen is not out for any sort of malignancy. We'll then talk about what the specimen is, the main findings, additional findings, and section code. So for our specimen, it is a nephrectomy specimen. So we'll wanna give a overall measurement and weight of that specimen. So we'll measure in three dimensions. And then we'll give a separate measurement of specifically just the kidney, which would be very similar for this case because there's not too much perinephric soft tissue. And then we want to give measurements for our ureter, renal vein, and renal artery. And some tips for identifying those structures would be to look at the lumen of each one. And the ureter is usually more of a star-shaped lumen. So you can see that on the cross-section up in the right-hand corner. That's what the ureter lumen would usually look like. It would have a star-shaped versus the renal vein and renal artery would be smooth lined. Another tip would be to open up the ureter longitudinally, like shown with the green arrow there. And the inside of the ureter will have these longitudinal ridges versus the renal vein and renal artery will be smooth lined, like I mentioned before. The renal vein is usually larger in diameter and has a thinner muscle wall. The renal artery is smaller in diameter and has a thicker muscle wall. So you can see with the arrows there, the blue one is showing the renal vein, and then the red one is showing the renal artery. So for our specimen here, we can find our, so this is our ureter here. And most of the time, our surgeons here will put a staple clip at the end of the ureter. Our vascular margins are usually stapled with a staple line. So you can see those there. So I'd wanna cut off this staple line here and then I'd be able to look at the lumen to be able to assess which one would be the renal vein versus renal artery. Other measurements that I would include for this would be the perinephric soft tissue. So that would be all of this fat located here. And then if I had an adrenal gland that was present, I would also be giving the measurements. So our main findings for these specimens will be the cystic renal parenchyma. So we'll want to describe the appearance of the cysts and then describe their contents. So the cysts might be filled with clear fluid, gelatinous material, or hemorrhage. So I'll go ahead and open one of these cysts here just so you guys can see what's inside of it. So it's just a whole bunch of clear yellow liquid. Other one.
And then I'd also want to be documenting the location of the cysts. So for our case here, the cysts grossly obliterate the entire kidney parenchyma. And then I'd be giving the size range of the cyst. So I want to give a size range for the smallest cyst and then the largest cyst. It's important too that we're serially sectioned through the entire specimen to look at all of the walls of the cyst. So we wanna carefully examine these cyst walls for any solid or thickened areas or papillary lesions, like the one shown in the image there with those red arrows. That one shows a incidental lesion that we found in a different polycystic kidney. It's important to identify these because these may be cancer. So our additional findings, so we'll want to describe any remaining parenchyma if present. So here's a picture of what normal kidney parenchyma would look like. And if you look at our specimen here, we don't really see anything that resembles grossly normal kidney parenchyma. And then we'll also want to describe the pelvic calyx seal system. So if it's dilated or if there's a calculi identified within it, we'll describe the ureter. So if there's stenosis or dilation or lesions. And then we'll also describe the vessels. So if there's any plaques or thrombus and we'll describe the adrenal gland if it's present. So for our sections for these kidney cases, so we do our vascular margin on FAS, our ureteric margin on FAS, and then we do three to four sections of the renal parenchyma with cysts. And we want to include any areas where the cyst wall is thickened or a little bit more abnormal. So those red arrows there are pointing out a few different areas that are a bit thicker than the normal cyst walls. And as well, they showed a bit of calcification. So those would be areas that I definitely want to be sampling. We'd also want to take sections of any incidental lesions. So like the one that we saw on the previous slide there. We take two sections of our non-involved kidney parenchyma if it's present, and then one section of our renal sinus and pelvis. And then if we have our adrenal gland, we'll take one cassette of the adrenal gland as well. So here is a sample gross description of a polycystic kidney. So the first paragraph there is talking about everything that the specimen includes. The second paragraph is our main findings and our additional findings. So it would be the kidney parenchyma is obliterated with multiple fluid-filled and gelatinous-filled cysts ranging in size from blank to blank in greatest dimension. No normal kidney parenchyma is grossly identified. The renal sinus and pelvis are grossly unremarkable. The renal vein, comma, renal artery, and ureter are grossly unremarkable. And then no distinct masses are grossly identified. So we'll always want to put in a pertinent negative too that says that we looked for masses and we did not find any. Our section code will be representative sections, and our sections will be our vascular margin, our ureteric margin, and then we'll do a section of the renal sinus and pelvis, and then our cystic renal parenchyma. So that's all that we have today. I just want to thank everyone for attending today's session. Thank you.